Okay, so here we go, last day of material. Nice job making it all this way. Uh, let's finish with a bang here. So, we've been talking about Darwin's theory of evolution. Yes? Can I just wash my hands? Okay. <laughs> we've been talking about Darwin's theory of evolution and how, over these last two days, we've seen that it doesn't just affect science. We've been talking mostly about the science over the course of this semester, but it goes so much deeper than that. Um, and that's what we've been uh, going into these last couple days. What I have in front of us right now is a uh, long quote. It's kind of a review of Darwin's book on the origin of species. And it's a review by Darwin's own professor. So I'm just going to kind of read it to you here. Well, there's a lot of words up there, so it might be hard to, to see those letters. Uh, he says, If I did not think you a good and tempered and truth-loving man, I should not tell you that I have read your book with more pain than pleasure. Parts of it I admired greatly, parts All right, I'm going to start over. <laughs> Darwin's professor Adam Sedgwick after reading Darwin's Origin of Species said, "If I did not think you a good and tempered truth-loving man, I should not tell you that I have read your book with more pain than pleasure." Parts of it I admired greatly, parts I laughed at till my sides were almost sore, other parts I read with absolute sorrow because I think them utterly false and grievously mischievous. You have deserted after a start in that tram road of all solid physical truth, the true method of induction. There is a moral or metaphysical part of nature as well as a physical. A man who denies this is deep in the mire of folly. Tis the crown and glory of organic science that it does through final cause link material to moral. You have ignored this link, and if I do not mistake your meaning, you have done your best in one or two pregnant cases to break it. Were it possible, which thank God it is not, to break it, humanity in my mind would suffer a damage that might brutalize it and sink the human race into a lower grade of degradation than any into which it has fallen since its written records tell us of its history. And what Sedgwick did here is he did nothing less than predict the history of the 20th century, where millions of people were killed under regimes that were guided by an evolutionary philosophy. Yes? Yes. Because, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Anybody else need to go anywhere? <laughs> um, so what do you suppose happens when you take the grand theory of evolution and you apply it to society as a whole? That's exactly what he's talking about right here. And I'll tell you what you get. You get the most horrific nightmare you could have ever imagined. It's known as social Darwinism, when you try and apply the ideals of evolution to society as a whole. No mistake that uh, the theory of evolution became really well accepted in the late 1800s, and then the 1900s was the most bloody century ever, by far. 130 million people were killed in the name of atheism, social engineering, and survival of the fittest. This is a uh, um, little bit about um, indigenous Australians. So uh, indigenous Australians were the black people of, of Australia who were there natively. And within a few decades of the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of Species, Australia's indigenous people were bearing the brunt of the surge of evolutionary belief. Aborigines were murdered, body parts were sent to European museums to provide evidence of an evolutionary dead end in the descent of man. So what they're saying here is that these black people are not really human. They are so close to gorillas, they would say back then, that they're not even human and so they would kill them and they would send their body parts to museums uh, and put them on display here how sick is that that's how sick society was and that's how sick it gets when you have an evolutionary worldview as your guiding source of truth this is a quote by darwin at some future period not very distant the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world the break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, instead of now, between the Negro or Aboriginal and the gorilla. In other words, what he's saying here is when we finally get rid of all the black people, 
then we will be so much further from our most common ancestor there. We'll be further separated from our monkey ancestors when we get rid of all these black people because they're so close to the gorilla. And it's like, this is the guy that secular academia holds above all else today. And how, how horrible is that? Right? This is from an Aboriginal inspector, 1908. I would not hesitate for one moment to separate a half-caste or a mixed-race Aboriginal baby from an Aboriginal mother, no matter how frantic her momentary grief. And the fact that he's saying it's momentary grief, it kind of indicates the evolutionary view that the mother was somehow less than fully human and not able to experience what real grief actually is. But of course, we know this is all just, this is all just junk. You know, this is not true. Uh, we've seen through science, through genetics, that the human race is all one race. We are far too similar than they ever could have dreamed back then. And more importantly, in the Bible, God says that we are all of one blood, descendants of Adam and Eve, and later Noah. And of course, Ernst Haeckel, we talked about him and his drawings the other day. Uh, he was German. He promoted the idea in the later 1800s that Darwinism required the abandonment of Christian morals and that evolution would bring forth a complete revolution in the entire worldview of humanity against the less evolved races. And that's exactly what happened in the 1900s, especially in the early part of it. There was so much genocide against what they would deem as inferior races. And you can see right here, uh, when Germany was colonizing Namib Namibia, they referred to these indigenous people as an inferior lower race, regularly referring to them as baboons. They were less than human for all intents and purposes. And of course, we, we saw this example um, from the book that we read. Uh, so this is Oda Benga in the Ancient Ancestors of Man exhibit in the Bronx Zoo in 1906. Of course, he was taken from his home in Africa and placed here as uh, an example of an ans a close ancestor to a monkey. And the New York Times had this to say. The pygmy was not much taller than the orangutan, and one had the good opportunity to study their points of resemblance. Their heads are much alike, and both grin in the same way when pleased. You're probably feeling about the same thing I am right now, right? <laughs> I'm a Christian man, but when I hear crap like this, I want to ball up my fist, go back to 1906, and hit somebody in the face. <laughs> the idea that these dark-skinned people are so, so close to, to gorillas and apes, how stupid, how ridiculous. And at the same time, how achingly predictable. This is exactly what the scientific community has a habit of doing, working off of bad information and bad data. From the 1890s on, intellectuals braced, embraced Darwinism and its implications. Before then, the sanctity of human life was a given in European law and thought. It was seen as a welcome alternative to prevailing Christian belief and ethics. Because again, we, as we talked about in the geologic record section, one of the biggest reasons that Darwinism got over and Christianity um, did not continue as it once did was because everybody saw this new way of thinking and they just thought it was fresh and new. And when you see something like that and you think it might be true, a lot of people jump on board and that's exactly what happened. And in Germany, we all know what, what happened here. Uh, those valuable to society have a greater right to life than others. Eventually this would lead to two world wars. And uh, what we're going to talk about before we get to that though is eugenics here. Um, Darwinists argued that there were inferior individuals within a race as well. And it was Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, who promoted genetic purification concepts. So this was uh, the idea that you can, you can actually control uh, the human race and that you should control the human race by preventing some people from having kids and having only the best people with the best genetics have kids. And this was popular in America. You probably didn't hear about this in your history class. In 1913, one out of three U.S. states had laws allowing for forced sterilization of those who were deemed unfit. In the 1920s, more than half of the states in the United States had laws like this. In the end, there were 70,000 people 
that were subject to these forced sterilizations. And these were just the ones who were documented. God only knows how many were undocumented. And this was an advertisement for the eugenics movement. Uh, so it says, eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. So again, it's like, uh, you know, evolution happened. That's mm. why we're all here. Everybody thought it was this wonderful thing. And it happens due to selective breeding. So why don't we just do selective breeding in the present? And this is an advertisement for it. If all marriages were eugenic, we could breed out most of this unfitness in three generations. And it talks about the, what they consider unfitness up here, epilepsy, feeble-mindedness, alcoholism. But um, so on the right side, it says you can improve your education and even change your environment. But what you really are was all settled when your parents were born. Selected parents will have better children. This is the great aim of eugenics. And it's like, I don't know about you, but talk about getting an awful taste in your mouth. Uh, th but this was exactly what was forwarded in our society back, at, especially in the 1920s. So this played a, a big part in World War I. German Darwinists used the idea that they were a superior race as one of the reasons to justify war on the states that they deemed inferior. Of course, there were many other reasons behind World War I, but uh, this certainly played a big part in it. Leading up to World War II, the German social Darwinist idea became a lot more widespread. So now we're talking the 1930s. And this is a quote from a Nazi propaganda film that I actually I saw uh, a while back. It said, All weak living things will inevitably perish in nature. In the last few decades, mankind has sinned frightfully against the law of natural selection. We haven't just maintained life unworthy of life. We have even allowed it to multiply. And at this point in the, in the, in the propaganda film, they show pictures of people that look like goofy and stuff. Uh, but this was the propaganda that was used uh, to get people to go along with that. Winston Churchill, of course, uh, says it very well, Germany is a power which spurns Christian ethics and which cheers its onward course by a barbarous paganism. As you can see by uh, this author here and anybody else who has done any research into Adolf Hitler, he says, the German Fuhrer, as I have consistently maintained, is an evolutionist. He has consciously sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. And you can see the result of that right here. Mm -hmm. And this is as a result of brainwashing. You know, Jews, black people, the Roma people, um, they're not really human. And that's what people were convinced of. That's the reason that your typical Nazi officer did not think twice of gassing 30 Jews at once because they were not considered human. It's like, does this sound familiar? Remember we talked about how, how the devil used the same lies over and over and over again? Like how unborn babies are just clumps of cells and they're not human? He, he tries to convince us of the same thing over and over and over. He does not change his tactics. How could civilized men commit such fearful acts as gassing pregnant women and shooting children and then burning their bodies and bulldozing them en masse into pits? Such things can only occur when an absolute rejection of God and his word, the Bible, allows an ideology of death to prevail, which convinces its adherents that the cause is just. When a nation rejects the God of the Bible, the fruit is bitter indeed. And it wasn't just Germany that participated in this type of social Darwinism. Uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, uh, played a big part too. So under Stalin, 20 million of his own people were killed. And it's no surprise that Darwin's book was his favorite. And in China, Chairman Mao, his favorite books, Origin of Species, and books by Thomas Huxley, who was also a Darwinist. And uh, we see the same thing over and over and over again. Same thing with this guy, um, Pol Pot. So he didn't kill as many people, but a much larger percentage of his own population. And again, this is where an evolutionary worldview leads. It leads you to despair. It leads you to war. It leads you to death. Jump around a little bit here. But the question kind of becomes, is God any better? 
Because oftentimes we hear, you know, God commanded the genocide and ethnic cleansing of the inhabitants of the land promised to the Israelites. Does that make him any better for wiping out all those people? And, uh, you know, a couple of things we have to know about the Canaanites here. They did all sorts of nasty things. They had child sacrifices, adultery, bestiality, and all sorts of other crazy, horrible things. And, and God is, he is the one who creates morality. Morality is objective. That's the Christian ideal. That's what we believe. God created all this so he can set the rules for us and he can decide when enough is enough. And again, the Israelites didn't just show up out of nowhere here. They were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. So they had plenty of time to get out of there. Uh, also, God's focus was mostly just on destroying the Canaanite religion. Here's a fun transition. While God is a God of love, he is also a God of perfect justice and righteousness. When Adam rebelled against God, the penalty was death, just as God had lovingly warned him. And that act of rebellion brought death and suffering into the world. It also imposed on all Adam's descendants the curse of that original sin, so that all mankind has been subject to death ever since. So as creator of all things, God has the right to do with his creation as he chooses. The biblical analogy is the relationship between a potter and the clay vessel he makes. The potter is entitled to fashion the clay as he sees fit, and to destroy what he knows to be irredeemable. And so it is with God and man. And that's tough for us to stomach right because our world tells us every single day how you know morality it's it's subjective you know it changes based on society but christianity is the exact opposite of that we acknowledge god as creator as the originator of an ethical moral code and a morality and we believe it's objective it is set and that's exactly what the world doesn't say but it kind of it kind mm -hmm. of brings up the point you know what if I think that God is wrong? Has that ever run through your mind? What if I don't understand God's reasoning? What if I believe God, have, God should have done something differently? And there's a one-word answer to each and every one of these questions. So when we're dealing with our own internal doubts, when we're dealing with our own internal battles, as we try and um, try and work out how God could be right to do some of the things he does and allow some of the things he does, we have to, above all, be humble. So first we have to make sure that we acknowledge that God is the creator, not me. And that's Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Furthermore, God is omniscient. He is all-knowing, not me. From Isaiah 55, verse 9, this is one of my favorite verses. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We have to stay humble. Job 38, this is one of my favorite verses too. So this is where Job, who was having all this awful stuff happen to him, and he's, he's, he spent so much of that book not questioning God, but then he finally comes out and he basically says, God, what, what could you possibly be thinking here? Why are you allowing all this bad stuff to happen to me? And God responds to Job in the same way that he would respond to us. He says, this he says the lord answered job out of the storm so whenever you think that you know better than god think of how him responding to job ties in with how he respond to you god says who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge brace yourself like a man i will question you and you shall answer me where were you when i laid the earth's foundation tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions surely you know who stretched a measuring line across it? 
On what were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. In other words, I created all this. Don't you dare question me. But we have to keep in mind, folks, this is not a careless God. Our God is not a God of suffering. Our God is not a God of death and destruction. Our God is a God of life and happiness. And that's why he sent his son to save us from the mess that we made. I, uh, I was shopping with my boy the other day and he's getting older and he's understanding a lot more and so he actually thought i stole something so my wife and i usually like to pay cash for things mm -hmm. and so he's usually sees us handing cash either putting it in the machine or or handing it to the cashier and in this particular instance we were shopping together and i used a credit card and when we were in the car he said daddy did you steal that i said no and he said, because, you know, he, he, he saw that I did not hand the person the cash. I said, well, John, I, I use my, my credit card, and that's, that's how we can pay for things, too. And he said, Daddy, I, I saw you put that credit card back into your wallet when you finished. And it's like, <laughs> I, I told him, I said, John, I love you. And you just have to trust that you don't know enough about this to know that daddy didn't steal. And you know what he said to me? He said to me, okay, daddy, I love you. And that's how we should respond when we see things that we don't understand and we're not sure how God could allow this to happen or why he, he allowed something else to happen. We should have that exact same response to him. It was a lesson to me. I'm gonna skip around a little bit here again. So humility is something that we ought to have. Let me tell you who's not humble, and that would be the scientific community. Uh, they, they walk around thinking and boasting how they got this all figured out. And that's one of, the, one of the big reasons that they'll never allow any real criticism of that naturalistic philosophy. Because it's easy to, to be arrogant when you think you know how everything got here. Not just you and me, but the whole world, the whole universe. And it's like a drug that they can't get off. But whenever we look at the actual science, like we've done in this class, we see evolution as a house of cards built on the faulty assumption of naturalism. When one learns to question the evolutionary assumptions, the house comes tumbling down, as it's done every single time we have looked into one of these sections of its supposed um, strengths. Every section that we've talked about is supposed strength of evolution, but we've found it's the exact opposite. They all have their own fundamental weaknesses. So why is this important? Well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that church attendance has been going down over the last 50 years, and it, it doesn't take a scientist to realize that um, a lot of the people that are being lost from the church are young people. And so obviously this is one of the main reasons that I, that I made this class. Um, church youth are already found to be lost in their hearts and minds in elementary, middle, and high school. Not in college, as many assume. Because the prevailing notion was these kids are all nice Christians, and then they go off to college, they're indoctrinated by their professors, and then they lose their faith. But it's been found that a lot of young people who leave the church made that choice actually while they were in middle school or high school. Yeah, they're still going through the motions, they're still going to church with their parents, but in their hearts and minds, they're lost. And uh, their responses through a lot of different surveys uh, was basically, they don't want to go to church anymore because science refutes the Bible. It's just a bunch of fairy tales. The church rejects what science tells us about the world. And you know what? If that was true, I'd be in their camp too. This is all about truth, folks. We want truth. We want truth to be illuminated. 
And what we've found in this class is that whenever you look at truth from the lens of naturalism, it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. But whenever you look at what's going on in the world with respect to the biblical version of history, all of a sudden it makes perfect sense. And we've seen that through every single section that we've gone through. But again, I can identify with the struggles of our young people today. You know, it's one of the, I went through them myself. And if you, if you look for answers on social media, uh, or, or anywhere else online, you're going to see the same naturalistic worldview and philosophy over and over and over again. So the question is, is there any good news to this? And I'm happy to report there is. Uh, Creation Ministries International, which is where I got a lot of the resources that, we, that I used to make this class, um, they did a study where they went around to campuses, college campuses all across the country, and they spoke to, you know, a lot of different students there, do you believe in evolution? Do you believe in creationism? Do you still go to church? Do you not? And what they found is that every student they spoke to who was equipped with answers as a young person still retains their Christian convictions in spite of the evolutionary teaching they received in higher education. Better still, every single student we spoke to who affirmed biblical creation still attends church regularly. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. When you're equipped with answers, it's much easier to resist those waves of naturalism that are going to come your way. And I really wish I had that preparation before I went through my secular education. Um, as I mentioned, I, I, I started my secular education in high school, so there's only so much grade school can provide for you from that. And I, I do give my, my grade school, Trinity Lutheran and Nina, uh, just untold amounts of credit for preparing me for that as well as they were able to. Uh, but yeah, you can't put a price on the stuff that you guys have learned in this class. And God saw all that he made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Unless you go by what many churches today teach. <laughs> because what we hear from a lot of different churches is that God used evolution to eventually bring humanity into existence. And if that's true, there are a lot of issues that you're going to encounter here. More, the most important one is that the gospel message is completely undermined. Let me just show you the foundation of the gospel here. It's very simple. God created man, man sinned, and that brought death and suffering into the world. So, what did you, or I'll quick, uh, just a quick recap of that then. From what Paul says in Romans, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. This is the foundation of the gospel message. So, what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus came into the world to reverse what we did, to make good the mistake that we made. So Jesus, true God, came into earth, also being true man, and he suffered a death having never sinned so that he could take all of our sins on his shoulder and reconcile us to God. Well, folks, if there were millions and millions of years of death and suffering in the world before man even came along, well... then that sin, that death, has no connection with us. And if it has no connection with us, if it's not here because of us, then why did Jesus come into the earth and die? It's not our fault. It was already here. It totally undermines the entire gospel message if you believe this. Furthermore, it makes God a liar because God says that his creation was very good, exceedingly good. It's not exceedingly good if it's surrounded by death and suffering. You'd have to believe that death is normal, even good, in God's presence. And that's not something I would certainly be able to reconcile. How does God really respond to death? We can see that here. In John chapter 11, this is the story of Lazarus. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. 
Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. You can see I, I bolded, deeply moved here. In the original language, in the original text, uh, what this alludes to is Jesus not just being emotionally upset here with death, but being angry with death. Death is an intrusion into our world. It wasn't meant to be this way. Take away the stone. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. Again, the world that we are in right now was not meant to be this way. Death did not originally have a home here. It's an intrusion into God's perfect creation. And in the same way that John tells us that story, he gives us a preview in the book of Revelation on what we have to look forward to. And I heard in a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and he will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. You know, we though we live in this world of sin and death and suffering, we are blessed to be here. It's an honor that God has seen fit for us to, to be used by him as his tools to further his kingdom in this world. It truly is a time of grace that, that we've been given. But in the end, we're just visiting. Because when all is said and done and you close your eyes for the last time in this world and you open them for the first time in the next, you're going to see your Savior face to face and he's going to come running up to you. He's going to give you a great big hug and he's going to say, welcome home. So how do we respond to this then? I've got three things that I want to kind of finish up with you here. Number one, God loves you. So be humble, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then be assured, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Sometimes people forget the second sentence here. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And finally, be amazed. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. And of course, it's not just the heavens that declare the glory of God. You're going to hear echoes in every nook and cranny of his creation, if only you listen for it. And so I do have one thing I would like for you to write down today. And that's the ethics and morality summary. I'll put this up later if you don't have something to write with, and that's okay. We'll just kind of roll with this right now, and I'll, I'll make sure that you have time to write it down. But um, God loves you more than you are capable of imagining. I hope you know that. I hope from the bottom of my heart that you know that. And no sin you've committed is beyond the scope of his forgiveness. You know, there are days when you might not feel loved. You may not love yourself. You may hate what you see in the mirror, but you know what? God never hates what he sees when he looks at you. You need to make sure you know that every single day. So, ethics and morality. We're finished with it. I don't remember how much you remember from the very first day of, of class when we started our journey here talking about cosmology, uh, but we began on, on this little path. And as we go down this path for the last time, you know, I didn't know this stuff when I was going through my secular education. <laughs> and if I did, it would have spared a lot of headache and heartache. 
but it was from those fires that that I was able to create this class and so I'm, I'm so excited and happy that I was able to do that and I know that's what God's purpose was for me then it took 10 years of really fighting these battles myself and looking for the real truth and it really it really um, affected me in a positive way so it's one of those times where you think, God, why are you letting me go through this? Why is it that I'm surrounded by all this unbelief? And why is it having an effect on me like this? And God says, just wait, and you'll see what plans I have for you. And uh, when you're able to, to look back over a few years like this, you'll be able to see exactly what God's doing in your life too. It's like a, a puzzle. You know, you're only able to look at that one puzzle piece right now, but years down the road when you can look back at that whole whole entire puzzle, you can remember when you were in that position thinking, God, what, what were you thinking? And then you stand back 10 years later and you say, oh, I get it now. That's happened to me every single time I thought to myself, God, what's going on here? Why are you allowing this? But yeah, I made this class so that you don't have to go through those same struggles I did. I made this class so that when someone tells you that science goes against what the Bible teaches, you can look at them square in the eye and say, no, it actually doesn't. And that can have a huge effect on people. Yes, this class is about strengthening your faith, but it goes beyond that. Because as, as you go your own ways and you walk your own paths that the Lord has laid out in front of you uh, for your own lives, um, now... Yeah, it's about making sure your faith has been strengthened, but now you have the ability to strengthen the faith of others. What, I, what I'm about to say, I believe wholeheartedly, if just a fraction more of our population knew what you guys know, that, that God loves them, and that they can trust his word from the very beginning, folks, we could turn this world upside down. So thank you for taking this class. May God bless you on your journey as you go forward in life. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you.